Good morning. Sorry, I was down in the basement to uh, talk to the kids and they were playing sheep and I joined in so it took a little bit, but uh, here I am. Um, it is Palm Sunday and you may notice you don't have palms, and that's okay. The uh, kids are going to be bringing them up when they come for the children's sermon. So you can kind of expect that, that they'll be, so you can kind of help them by saying we need this many and passing them around and all that. Um, yeah, so it's a little different. We aren't gathering downstairs or any of that. Um, and I just want to assure you, it has nothing to do with COVID. It has to do with helping the kids and all of us better understand what Palm Sunday is all about. So, I'll call your attention to the announcements that are printed in the bulletin. A reminder that we have our Holy Week services, Maundy Thursday at Saren at 7, Good Friday here at Baxter at 7, and then uh, we begin here on Easter Sunday with breakfast at 8, and then we have worship at 9, and breakfast is going to be, I think, pancakes and sausages that the kids are making, so please come for breakfast on Easter. The Luther Haven Annual Meeting will be held on Monday, April 11th, beginning at 5.30. And uh, now we are very glad to know they are serving a meal again. So we're back to normal. That was the best part about, the two best parts about being on the Luther Haven board or being a delegate. One, it's a short meeting. They run a nice meeting. And two, they have really good roast beef every year. So if anyone asks you, if you get a call from the nominating committee, you ask them, are, are Keith and Ramona done with that yet? Because that's what I'd like to do. So, uh, The Joint Ministry Board is going to meet at the church office at 8 o'clock after confirmation on Wednesday, April 20th. If you've got suggestions, ideas, comments about worship, let me or one of the representatives know. Uh, we're excited to be hosting an event at the Kilowatt Community Center in Granite on Sunday, April 24th from 2 to 5. Uh, we're going to welcome children of all ages and their families from several area churches. The Lackawarra Conference Welka Spring Gathering is coming up on Tuesday, April 19th in Monty. And... Well, the other one's done. Uh, the Baxter Council meeting has been rescheduled, and that will be also held on April 20th at 7 o'clock here at church. That is because Thrivent is coming out to talk about how to best manage the donations that we got. So that's why that meeting has been rescheduled. And speaking of Thrivent, the Youth and Family Board is looking for a Thrivent member who's willing to apply for an action team card for an event in May. So if you're a Thrivent member, you get two of these $250 cards a year. If you have one to spare, please let us know. It's a very easy application. If you'd like help with it, we'll help. Uh, there will be a brief congregational meeting following worship at Baxter on April 24th to talk about our ideas for an area for families with young children. And there's a few more details on that. If you have questions about it, ask a council member or ask me. Uh, we were able to bag and box 47 school kits. We thank everyone for their generosity in buying kit supplies, sewing bags, and packing kits. Are there any other announcements that should be brought forward this morning? We'll begin then by praying together. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week and gather at your house of prayer, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, so that, united with Christ and all the faithful, we may one day enter in triumph, the city not made by human hands, the new Jerusalem, the eternal heaven.
Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Jesus, our Lord, we shout hosannas to praise you. With eager hands we place our cloaks and palms on the path before you. Yet, Lord, we confess that the mouths that seek to praise you often deny or defy you. And we confess that the hands that seek to serve you often become fists. Lord, hear us as we confess. <laughs> Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Hosanna. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Ride on, Lord Jesus upon a colt, over cloaks, under branches. Right on, Lord Jesus. Toward a city, through its gates, past the crowds. Right on, Lord Jesus. As hosannas fade and enemies sneer, as danger closes and friends falter. Right on, Lord Jesus. Showing the way, teaching the truth bringing life for all in the name of the Lord. Ride on, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the lectionary has effectively eliminated Palm Sunday, and instead they've revived an ancient tradition of Passion Sunday, for reasons that I won't go into right now. But I just want you to know that the first and second readings are Passion Sunday readings that are part of the lectionary, and the Gospel reading and the Psalm are Palm Sunday readings. I've chosen to, to stick with Palm Sunday for a few reasons, but part of it is there really isn't a difference. The procession into Jerusalem is as essential to the resurrection as the crucifixion is. It's all part of the same cloth. So as we hear the first two readings, the reading from Isaiah, it's one of the four servant songs in 2nd Isaiah. And many people over the years have come to believe that these words that Isaiah writes are the words of Jesus. And it's really easy to see how that might be. As you hear the reading today, you'll hear the, the speaker say, I am beholden to God. God has been good to me, and because of that, I've been willing to suffer. I have been willing to let myself be abused, because I know that God is not only going to prove my innocence, but lift me up. So it fits perfectly with the life of Christ. And the second reading is... A lot of it is a quote from something much older than the New Testament. Paul is quoting an early Christian hymn. And in that hymn, it talks about Christ's obedience, his willing to die, and his being lifted up. So that's the passion side of it that we'll hear read first. And it makes a good background for, for the whole piece. The first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Sovereign Lord has taught me what to say, so that I can strengthen the weary. Every morning he makes me eager to hear what he is going to teach me. The Lord has given me understanding, and I have not rebelled or turned away from him. I bared my back to those who beat me, 
I did not stop them when they insulted me, when they pulled out the hairs of my beard and spit in my face. But their insults cannot hurt me because the Sovereign Lord gives me help. I brace myself to endure them. I know that I will not be disgraced, for God is near, and he will prove me innocent. Does anyone dare bring charges against me? Let us go to court together. Let him bring his accusations. The Sovereign Lord himself defends me. Who then can prove me guilty? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're comfortable for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully, with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, o Christ. Please be seated. So I hope you see a little bit of how this all goes together. There's a lot of up and down, right, in the, the servant song. And in the second lesson, Christ is coming down. He came to earth to live as a human, and he was raised, but only as far as the cross, and then he was raised again. Jesus, in our, the beginning of our gospel reading, is at the top of the Mount of Olives, and he is about to descend to Jerusalem. This idea of going down in order to be lifted up runs throughout our readings and, and throughout Scripture. Luke's account is set up by a familiar story in the parable. You'll notice our reading today starts with after he had said this. You always go, what? After he had said what? Right? Well, right before this, we have first the story of Zacchaeus. And that's one that we know well. A lot of us sang about Zacchaeus in Sunday school. But the main thing to remember about Zacchaeus is his response to God. First of all, he said, I will give half of everything I have to the poor. And secondly, he said, anyone I defrauded, I will pay back four times as much. And 
Jesus replies to that, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. So we've got the story of Zacchaeus, followed by the parable of the ten pounds, which is also told as the parable of the talents. And that's one thing, with all these different versions, it's important sometimes to keep them straight. In this version, there is this nobleman, and he is important. And I'm sure if you asked him about his importance, he would be glad to tell you about it. And the situation is, he's getting ready to go somewhere to ask the king to acknowledge how important he is. He's going to get royal backing to make him even more important. And he is not at all well loved. In fact, it says, the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. So this man is the anti-Jesus. He is a person who has power and wants more. He is a person who is despised. And he has three servants and he gives them each 10 pounds. One servant doubles the money, one servant gets 50% return on investment, the third one says, I know what kind of person you are, and I know you really didn't get this money in a legitimate way, and I was scared, so I buried it. So here it is. Please take it back. I never wanted it in the first place. And the man returns, and he returns having received royal power. So now this guy is even more of a big shot. And he says, I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given, but from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did want, not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. So these are the last words that Jesus speaks before this. Now having said this, the last thing that he says is, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. He's quoting somebody else, but Jesus is saying this. It's quite a setup, right? We, we hear that Christ has come to find the lost and to save, and we meet the anti-Jesus. And this whole approach of Jesus, it seems humble, right? He rides on a donkey. And there is nothing impressive about a man riding on a donkey, on a, on a young donkey in particular. In particular, they throw a couple of cloaks over him. I picture his feet dragging on the ground, I really do. But there he is on this donkey. But it, even though it looks humble, this is a clear and deliberate statement by Jesus that he is the Messiah. Riding the donkey connects him to the prophet Zechariah. Oh, I love the names of the prophets. Zechariah said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he is setting himself up as king by riding that donkey. And now not just the twelve, but the whole multitude of disciples begin singing Psalm 118. And when we read Psalm 118, unless you're very familiar, familiar with it, I think you'll be surprised by how many little bits of that have ended up on plaques in people's homes throughout the year. It's a very famous traditional psalm. And when the people begin to sing this, it means something. This is a psalm that they would have sung during Passover all the time. So between the donkey and the singing of the psalm, the people are both acknowledging that Jesus is king, and they're pleading for his help. They're asking him to save them. Now we know, don't we, that Jesus is riding to his death. The people along the path most likely hoped that that wasn't the case. 
And we know that these songs of praise are going to soon give way to chants of crucify him. So it's real easy for us, like the lectionary, to kind of pass right through Palm Sunday without thinking about it. We can see it as sort of ironic, right? That one moment Jesus is being praised as king, and the next minute he's being heckled as king. We can see it as, as futile, and especially we can see the people, we can write off the people along the path. They weren't really faithful. If their faith would have been deep, well, what do the disciples say? Before I betray you, I die, they all say. Right? Da -da 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 -da, and they charge out, determined to die for Jesus, and then when trouble comes, they run away. And it's the same with the crowds. Now Luke makes it clear that none of this is true. None of that that I just said is the truth. And he especially makes it clear with these Pharisees. Every time we hear about Pharisees, we think about bad guys. They're always the foil to Jesus. They're always the ones who don't listen, who don't believe, who are too legalistic. But these Pharisees don't fit that mold. They're among the crowd, and they address him as teacher. And most importantly, if they wanted him dead, all they have to do is step back. Jesus is well on his way to provoking the government to killing him. He is giving them no choice. So there's no point in them asking him to tell people to stop, except that they're fearing for his safety. So when the Pharisees tell him, tone it down, what they're telling him is, hey, Pilate is coming in on the other side of town. Right now. So as you process in, in your particular glory, Pilate is coming in, in his glory. And you know what? One thing about people in power, they don't like it when other people have power too. Especially when they're people who aren't, they don't view as their equals. So you've got to stop this, Jesus. Shut it down. If you've got to come to town, at least sneak into town. But Jesus isn't going to do that. He is absolutely throwing it in the face of the powers that be. Here I am. Remember what Jesus says in Gethsemane when they arrest him. He says, why are you arresting me now in the dark? I was standing there in plain sight. Why did you arrest me when I was preaching in the temple? Like He knows why. He's pointing out the cowardice. So, and we get this cool line about the stones. Even if these people were all silent, the very stones would cry out. There are some different ways to understand that. One is that it's just inevitable. Even the stones can figure out that I'm going to die. I mean, come on. This is, I'm past the point of no return. Another way is to say that all creation is aware of it. But you can also think, you know that expression, if the walls could talk? If the stones in the road to Jerusalem could talk about all of the various conquerors who have arrived, about all of the rebellions that have been put down through mass slaughters, of all the blood that's been spilled on the stones on the road to Jerusalem as it goes back and forth, who has power? They would cry out. Here we go again. And it's in a very important detail, I think, that in Luke, the very next thing that Jesus does when he comes into sight of the city is he weeps. He talks about the tragedy of Jerusalem's history. And he hearkens back to the warnings of another prophet, a prophet whose name is even more fun to say, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. There is a passage there where Habakkuk has warned the powers that be about their fate if they choose to follow the path that they're on. And of course they don't. And he says, and I read this in the King James because all prophecies of, the, of doom should be read in the King James Version. 
For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. Jesus pauses right here. And that warning is being made clear to Jerusalem again. This is your history, and unless you do something about it, this is your future as well. You have a choice. You have a choice. To the east is Jesus. To the west is the forces of the government. And you know your history. You know what happens when you turn away from the Lord. You know that destruction and despair and sorrow will follow. Always. But I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, yeah, but those guys have weapons. And those guys are here right now. And if I don't, I'm scared of those guys. Can't we make a deal? Jesus knows that he's going to die and he knows what it means. He knows that again Jerusalem is turning its back. And that's where we are again and always. We are Jerusalem. We are faced with a choice between turning toward Christ or yielding to our fears and are yearning for earthly power. And Jesus weeps for us. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 264.
Please stand as you're comfortable and join me as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, as we step into Holy Week, open our hearts and minds. May this coming week be holy for us. May we live this time expecting that in some way you will meet us. Lord, in your mercy, in whatever way we live this week, give us the times and spaces to ponder again that you know and understand suffering, and you offer to meet us and hear us once again. Our struggles over this past year and old pains that have not healed for us, inner struggles that never quite seem to go away. May this week help us to name and offer to you our wounds. Help us tune into your wisdom and response to us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we may not have the words for our prayers. We may not understand ourselves as much as we would like. But we step into this week trusting in the tradition of which we are a part. That by pondering your walk toward the cross, by focusing on Jesus' last journey, somehow you will speak to us on our journey. You will honor our effort and intention and draw us closer to you. So in the quietness of our hearts now, we speak to you of our intentions for this holy week. Lord, in your mercy, we place ourselves in your hands, gracious God trusting in your mercy and relying on your presence as we strive to grow in what, into what we are meant to become. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, please. Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. Thank
just the accolades left. So keep keep a couple for or keep one for yourself, set the rest by the cross, and then give these, give the accolades one each, please. Okay, I don't want to mess up. So as we read responsibly the 118th Psalm, remember that this is an ancient song of praise and that this is, for the most part, what was being said as Jesus entered Jerusalem. The stone that the builders rejected. This is the Lord's doing. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. You are my God, and I will praise you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And faithful love endures forever. Now, you'll notice that I did not bless the palms this year, and that normally we do bless the palms, but I decided not to because it's not consistent with what we do. Right? We don't use holy water. We don't take any particular steps with the sacraments, with the elements. The wine comes directly from the liquor store to here, to the rail. So, it really doesn't make sense to me to bless the palms, because when we bless the palms, what we do is we turn them into something called a sacramental. And a sacramental is something that we use to, remind, to help ourselves when we worship. So, if we bless these palms, then we'd need to treat them with a certain reverence. We would maybe take them home and, and display them or make them into something, but we certainly wouldn't throw them in the garbage and we most certainly wouldn't give them to the pastor to feed his sheep, right? Because that's not what we do with sacramental things. Sacramental things are things that are blessed. For example, if someone was in the hospital sick and we said, we want you to bless this object, this cross, this whatever, so that when this person in the hospital holds it, they know that it's something special. And we don't do that. So I think that if we bless the palms, it would kind of be making a mockery of the very idea of blessing things. So that's why we're not blessing the palms. All right, now, you guys. I'll bet you can guess why we call this Palm Sunday. Any guesses on why we call this Palm Sunday? Yes. Because they use palm leaves, right? And we call this Palm Sunday because this is the week when we have palm leaves. It's the only time we do, right? So it's Palm Sunday. Now, you're right, absolutely right, about the fact that that happened. Have you ever wondered why they put palm leaves on the ground? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I shouldn't have a microphone. You should have a microphone. Do you mind talking into this? You do mind or you will? Okay, she doesn't want to. Sorry. Shows either. But one of the things that an award show is the red carpet, right? 
and they roll out a red carpet. You ever heard of that? They put out the red carpet and people get out of their limousines and get their pictures taken. And a big part of that is so that they don't get their $9,000 shoes that they're only going to wear once dirty. Right? So they walk out, I'm inspired, special and I'm important, take my picture. And that's part of it. That Jesus was special and they knew he was special so they didn't want him to get his feet dirty. Now in, in the reading that, that Reese read, we had palms. In the reading that I read, we had coats. People laid their coats on the ground. And both of those things are reported. And I always think some people did both. You know what I mean? Some people took off their coats and put them on the ground. And some people took palm leaves and put them on the ground. And there's only one story in the Bible about people putting their coats on the ground other than this one. There was this really mean, nasty king back in the book of Kings. And he was super important. And you know what the worst thing you can do is to somebody who thinks they're really important? You know what makes them the maddest of anything? Yell at them. That's a good guess, but there's something that can make them even madder. Go ahead. Oh, to support someone else and say, this person, you might be in here all that, but this person, yeah, that's good too. Any other ideas on what you could do to make someone, you ever know someone, you guys are too little to go through this, yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you take the stuff that makes them think they're special, that's a good one, yeah. So, there's that part of it. So, but the palms are even a bigger deal. And I didn't think of this. I should have thought of this. You know, the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they were in the desert for 40 years, right? They were in the desert for 40 years. How important is green stuff in the desert? Like, what do you know if you're in the middle of the desert and you see something green? Yes? That there's light. That there's light, right? That there's water. And water and life are the same thing in the desert, aren't they? Aren't they? So for years and years and years, after the people were in the promised land, their celebrations always included something green. Because they're thanking God for saving them. Makes sense, doesn't it? We were rescued from the desert. We came to the water. Thank you, God, for life. So these cloaks and these leaves are not only practical in holding down the dust and in making, letting Jesus know your feet don't have to touch the ground. What they're saying is, we know that you're the king. We know that you are our king, and we need you to save us. Jesus, we need you to save us. So that's a pretty cool deal. Yes? You're right. Our shoes touched the ground, not our feet. And Jesus could have been wearing sandals or not wearing sandals. And you're right, but it's more of a like a, a symbolic deal. You know, like rolling out the red carpet. This is a special path just for you. You know, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be not everything has to make sense. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. All right, so now here we are at the rail, and Jesus has come, and we are at this point where we're almost at Easter, and everybody's going to take communion. Okay? Oh, is your dance perfect too? So you remember the story of communion? It's about the same time. Jesus sits down with all, yep. Yep. And lots of people are tra lots of people travel for Easter, don't they? So that's okay. Yeah. 
That's all right. I'm glad you're here today. So remember what happens? The first, the, or I'm sorry, the, the first communion is right about at this time. It's the night before Jesus was killed. So it would be Thursday night. And Jesus sits down with his friends, and what do they do? They sleep? They sleep a lot. Yeah, there they do. What do they do at the last supper? Yes. They eat, right? And when Jesus breaks the bread to pass it out, he says, This is my body given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And after they eat the bread, what do they do? They remember him, right? And after they eat the bread, then they eat, yep. Then they drink the wine, right? And Jesus takes the wine and he thanks God for it. And he says, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then they say, we don't know what they say, but we say the Lord's Prayer together. So let's do that, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in the great name. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. Receive the commission and benediction. It was never promised that you will not be tempted, nor thrown into turmoil, nor stumble or fall, but that by grace you will be saved through trusting God. Grace is a free gift of God, gift, an ongoing gift, for me, for you. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. You have a destiny to inherit over which the angels in heaven marvel. The quiet strength of Christ, the humble power of God, and the pervasive light of the Spirit is yours, today and always. <laughs> 